Would you pray with me one more time? Lord, I feel very small today. I feel like I have no words. I just ask for you to hide me behind the cross of Jesus and that Jesus be lifted up and that he be our beautiful hope. And as the young people sang, that our hearts are his home. Amen. There are two big responses that we have as human beings when we face suffering and illness. Number one, it is very normal to think we must have then done something wrong. And you look in the Bible, the, the story of Job, and that was the big discussion. Because Job had some painful things happen, and his friends came and wanted to work with him and to labor with him. What had he done wrong to bring this on himself? So that is a, uh, an idea that is very normal, that it's very incorrect. Another response is that there isn't a good reason. A good God wouldn't allow suffering. So either he is not there, he's not real, or he's not good. And that's another response that people have in this world. I visited a man in Seattle, Seattle's Veteran Hospital. This man was a World War II veteran. I have a great respect for this man. And there was a heaviness in the room. There was a, a heaviness of spirit that he was experiencing. And I, I wanted to encourage him. This is a man who was court-martialed in World War II about Sabbath observance. And he was willing to be sentenced to a long prison sentence rather than do what he did not feel his conscience would allow him to do on the Sabbath. And he ended up not being sent to the stockade because the General Conference reached out to his congressman and his congressman uh, intervened and his Sabbath uh, rights were, were, his religious rights were protected. But this is the kind of man this was. He was the real deal. And I was, I was thinking, what could I say to encourage him? We have to be really careful with that. What can I say to make it better? I've heard stories from people going through very difficult times where they will see friends and the friends will turn and go the other way because the friends feel like, I don't know what to say. I don't have words to make it better. I can't fix it. I can't say anything to make it better. I don't know what to say. And so I'm ashamed of that. So I'm going to turn away. I, I, I remember I had one friend who, who's something very tragic happened in her life. And she told me she would be in the grocery store and she would see good friends and they would turn around and go the other way. And it wasn't that they didn't love her, is they felt they needed to somehow do something in the situation other than be with her. We can't fix things. We have to be very careful when we think we've got to have words that somehow make it better. With that being said, there are encouraging words we can offer, but they don't fix anything. But hopefully they can encourage. So I was thinking of something to say, and so I said to my friend, if Jesus came into your hospital room, and there we are at the Veterans Hospital in Seattle, if Jesus came in your room, what would he say to you? No, I thought he would say something like, 
I will never leave you or forsake you. I thought he would say something like, I love you. I'll never forget you. I've graven you on the palms of my hands. I'm your shepherd. Yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be with you. I thought he would say something like that. If Jesus came to your room, what would he say? And there was no hesitation. And, and the words were just hurled across the room. Stop sinning! And I realized that we have someone called the accuser, the devil. The name means accuser. And my friend was very sick, and the enemy was accusing him. Remember I said, we must have done something wrong. And so my friend was looking at himself and was, was feeling like his illness was due to something wrong that he had done. And he was being tormented by that thought. So I had my Bible with me and I read to him 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 13. This is the verdict. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And we, I shared some other Bible verses with him about the love of Jesus and the grace of Jesus. And about two weeks later, he went to sleep, and I was so grateful to be able to share God's word with him. But it reminded me how typical it is as humans, living in a world where there is a, an accuser who is a liar, who will want to take our eyes off Jesus and onto ourselves. There is so much in this life that would make no sense if we did not have the book of Job. I read a, a Jewish rabbi, a very famous Jewish rabbi, who did a commentary on the book of Job. And as I read what he said, the book of Job made him really, really angry. I mean, I, in his words, I could just feel the rage. Because he said... Here we have God making bets with the devil over Job and his children. If we did not have the book of Job, though, and if we didn't have some verses in the New Testament, it would not give us an understanding, big picture of what is going on in our world. In Revelation chapter 12, it says that there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon, that great serpent, was cast out of heaven with his angels. So we know we're born in a war. If we don't know that, nothing in our lives will make sense. Because things happen that shouldn't happen. And good does not always prevail. And there is cruelty and there is goodness, but it's mixed together and it doesn't make sense unless we know we're born in a war. We think of our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. We brought a pastor over to pastor a Ukrainian church and it's a wonderful pastor. And he was in Kiev, the capital city of Ukraine, and he sent his family out into the country because missiles were just hitting the city. But he didn't leave because he wanted to be there to support his church family. And I asked him, 
when the missiles were hitting, and you, you saw pictures how missiles were hitting and apartment buildings were being blown up, I said, where would you go? Would you go down to the bomb shelters? And he said, the bomb shelter was such a long way from my apartment that when the missiles were coming, it, it, I, I would have had to live in the, in the bomb shelters. So he said, I would go in my bathroom and get in the shower. And that's where he hid when the missiles were hitting his city. The book of Job tells us that there is a backstory. And it doesn't give us all the details, but it gives us the plot of what's in the what in the world is going on in our world. We know something that Job didn't know and wasn't told. What we know, Job didn't get to hear. Would you go to the next slide, please? So Job and, or, so God and the devil are having a conversation when Adam gave up his leadership of this planet, Adam and Eve, Satan became the leader of this planet, sadly. In 1 John, it says the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Satan has a certain amount of control. And then when Jesus came, the devil was defeated, praise God. But this is what it says. The devil made this accusation against Job and God. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the works of his hands so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. So what is the enemy saying, accusing God and accusing Job in this? He is basically saying that God is not lovable. That, that who God is is not lovable. And the only reason someone would want to be friends with God and love God is for what God could do for you. And he was accusing Job that Job was a gold digger. He was a fair weather friend. The only reason he loved God was because of what God could do for him. Come on. Don't we as humans, you see an older, wealthy man with a younger, beautiful wife, and what do you think? They're making an exchange. He has money. She has youth and good looks. They're making an exchange. That's what we think as human beings. He was making that accusation against God. That God was, isn't lovable. And the only way God could have friends is for the goodies. And so Job lost his health, his possessions, and his children. The enemy was basically saying that Job didn't really love God. He loved himself, and he was loving and serving himself instead of God because he had this understanding that serving God would bring him blessings. So his love and service to God was really love and service to himself. That's what the enemy was saying. One of the classic stories of marriage that comes out of history is the story of Charles and Sally Wesley. You know Charles Wesley who wrote this, the hymn, the Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. He wrote, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And he wrote one of my favorite hymns, And Can It Be That I Should Gain. Amazing love, how can it be that thou my God should die for me. Charles Wesley. When he married Sally, she was extraordinarily beautiful. And they got along really well. In fact, people who wrote about their marriage said it was a marriage made in heaven. A rare marriage. 
But Sally got smallpox. And after that, she wasn't beautiful anymore. Her once beautiful skin was now heavily marked with the, the smallpox. So now, does he love her for her beauty? Or does he love her for her? And Charles told Sally, he said, I'm glad this happened so that you will know I never loved you for your beauty. I loved you for you. And the enemy is, he's pushing all his chips on this idea. Do we love God for himself? Do we love him when we don't understand when he, what he's doing? Do we love him when our hearts are broken? Do we love him when like Jesus, Jesus on the cross, he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? When we feel alone, when we can't feel his presence, but do we love him? Next slide, please. And Job said some profound things. And I really don't believe Christianity would be what it is if there wouldn't have been Job's experience. Because millions and millions of people have, have taken hope when their hearts are broken, when life is so difficult from the story of Job. Some of the classic lines where Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And then what else did he say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is good. All the time. Even when my heart's broken. Even when I'm waiting. Even when it's been 29 days. And we so desperately... We so desperately are pleading with him. And we wait. And we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, Yet in my flesh, I will see God. Do you notice what Job did there? After my skin has been destroyed, he knew he was going to die. He was talking about the resurrection. Yet in my flesh, I'm going to be resurrected and I'm going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Does your heart yearn? Next slide, please. One of my heroes is a woman named Anne Johnson Flint. She was born in New Jersey in 1886 on Christmas Day. Three years later, her mother died giving birth to her sister. And three years after that, her father died. So she and her sister in the 1800s were now orphans. Now, today we have quite a few social networks and, and ways to help. But in those days, it came down to family and friends. She was adopted by a couple, the Johnsons. So she went by Flint was her birth name. And then, uh, excuse me, Johnson was her birth name. And then she, Mr. and Mrs. Flint adopted her. She was raised by them, 
she was a very observant child. She was so observant that one day she said to somebody, it's going to rain. And they said, how do you know? She said, the robin's singing has changed. And then it started to rain. She could, she could hear in nature what nature was doing because she listened. She eventually, as she grew up, she became a school teacher. And she started feeling physical problems in her body. And the doctors told her she had a crippling disease and that she was no longer be able to teach. She was going to be bedridden. And now she was totally dependent on the kindness of others. People told her, if you have enough faith, if you just have enough faith, if you screw up your faith, you will be healed. And she read her Bible. And she came to the conclusion that yes, God wants us to have faith. But that faith doesn't hold God hostage. And that faith is not just in what God can do, but it's in him and it's in his heart. She said, God can heal. I believe he can. But I believe in him even if he doesn't. That's what real faith is. The one thing of beauty that was left in her life was her poetry. She was an amazing poet. And a magazine picked up one of her poems and then another. And finally, her poetry was published in a book. And one of her most famous poems was put to music. And it became a hymn. And the title of the hymn is, He Gives More Grace. Now, this picture um, that you just saw, that picture, is her later in life, but still not very old, in a wheelchair. She spends the rest of her life in a wheelchair or in bed. And I want you to, I want you to hear the words of her song, He Giveth More Grace. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplied his multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. We have the book of Job, and we also have the book of Habakkuk. Small book, only three chapters. But in that book, the prophet Habakkuk was living during the time after King Josiah. And King Josiah was a good, thick, good king, he led the people back to worshiping God, but then King Josiah's sons were not good kings. And people 
begin worshiping idols again. And the Babylonians were coming, and the Babylonians were doing very cruel things. And Habakkuk could not understand how God could allow evil and suffering. In fact, I would encourage you to go back and read the book of Habakkuk. There's one point that is just a classic moment in all of literature where he climbs the tower and he says, I'm going to wait for God to answer me. The audacity of faith that he would say, I'm here, God, and I'm going to wait for your answer. And there's some profound things in the book of Habakkuk. One of the most profound scriptures in, uh, is that phrase, the just will live by faith. And Martin Luther, that was the verse that was like a key that opened up for him the gospel. The just will live by faith. Well, at the end of the book of Habakkuk, there is a hymn that again is one of the most profound words in all of literature. Let's go to the next slide, please. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The fact that he asked that question tells us that the end of time is going to be a very difficult time to have faith. We always heard that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. When people were willing to die for their faith, to give up everything. It made those who watched that say, I wish I had something that was worth everything to me, that meant that much to me. I heard an account of Korea because in in the early 1900s, there was about 1% of the population of Korea who were Christians. And there were some big revivals that happened in Korea. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit used to bring about this great revival to the point where now it's about 40% of the population are Christians. Is Korea is a a shame-based culture. In other words, keeping face, uh, not being shamed, not shaming your family is really, really important. And one of the things that happened is these Christians started confessing and making things right. If they had stolen something, they would go and they would pay it back and they would would ask forgiveness. And that openness and that humility in the face of everything in the culture saying, you don't do that. And here you had these Korean Christians doing that. And it led the population of Christians to go from 1% to 40%. Because they saw something that was greater than culture, that was greater than feelings, and it was powerful. I believe that in the day and time we're living in, one of the biggest things we can do to demonstrate is to trust God and rejoice in Him when he is silent, and when the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes in the vines, and though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, when it's been 29 days, but we're here, and we're looking to you, 
and we're trusting to you. And we're putting beautiful Vivian in your hands, Lord. And no matter what, we trust you. And we're just trusting that you'll give more grace. All the grace we need to carry our beloved Rudy and Vivian and us through this journey.